Hello, welcome. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Center of Excellence in Evolutionary Therapy. My name is Alexander Anderson and I'm the director of the Center of Excellence. And we're going to sp speak specifically about how we integrate evolution with mathematical models to drive new patient strategies. So evolutionary therapy, um, the whole principle ha behind it is really to develop and deploy the next generation of truly personalized cancer therapy through the integration of predictive mathematical models, patient data, and crucially, evolutionary principles. You're probably asking yourself, what is an evolutionary principle? Well, Darwin provides us a really clear one for a recipe for evolution, and that is it requires just variation and selection, those two elements. And in cancer, we actually have both of those elements. This shows um, multiple samples from patients with colorectal cancer, and they get a small biopsy taken, and then that biopsy stained. In this case, just focus on the pink, because the pink shows that they have a specific mutation in those cells. And if you look across each one of those little discs, what you can see is the amount of pink is very different in each disc. Um, and if you look even within a single sample, which is for a single patient, um, you see that there's variation in that single disc. And so that really illustrates how heterogeneous cancer is. Within a patient and across patients, we have this natural variation that's present. So we have the first element for that recipe for evolution. This shows a patient, um, it's a scan that highlights the um, metabolic activity in that patient. And the red there shows the cancer. In this case, it's a metastatic melanoma patient and the cancer spread all over their abdomen. In, in a normal uh, patient, this would look like just their head and their bladder would be red. All of that other red shouldn't be there. But what's kind of amazing about this patient is that they were treated with a new targeted drug that goes after the specific mutations that that cancer has. And a mere two months later, that patient, their skin would look basically normal. But the, if you look closely here, you can see there's small lesions, this, this green that you see within um, just below their lungs. Um, it really highlights that there's still some cells remaining that are not responding to that treatment. And in fact, those cells are resistant to that treatment. And six months later, that tumor has come back and spread back almost in the same location that it was previously. And that patient now went on to die as a result of that disease. So they, the melanoma came back, it was resistant to that treatment. So what we see here is that treatment is the key force of selection that's going to drive the evolution of resistance. So resistance, drug resistance, is a natural outcome of really these sort of targeted aggressive treatments for metastatic disease. So one of the things that we're trying to do is combine our principles of evolution with mathematical modeling, because then we can predict how these cancers might evolve and grow, and how then we can potentially manipulate that evolution to our own gain. Mathematical models have been used extensively in trying to understand the weather, another unpredictable system. This shows the tracks from the last hundred years uh, of hurricanes across the Atlantic, and the, the eye of those hurricanes have been traced and all plotted together. And if you were to just look at this on average, you might think that, well, essentially, it's going to move across the Atlantic and then up. Um, and of course, that wouldn't actually be too bad at predicting prediction, and that's something that we um, had recently here in Florida when we had this hurricane pass through and we were predicting it was going to move across and up. And each one of those lines, in fact, is a, a mathematical model that's been simulated and is predicting how this hurricane eye is going to move and traverse the state, but it's also using this historic data as well as these models. So mathematical models can be used to predict what the future is going to look like for these hurricanes. And of course, by analogy, what we want to do is use those models to predict the future of a patient's response to treatment. However, a key point here is that the data that drives those models um, will influence how predictive they can be. 
And one of the issues that we had with the hurricane that was passing through Florida was that the data was biased because what was happening was the planes were only flying in from the east to the west and oversampling and giving information on how that hurricane was moving up the coast. And that actually biased the prediction of those models. But you can see it was in, in fact very diverse. There's some of those models are predicting it moving all the way up the west, even skipping uh, Cuba almost. As it approached more and more, we were able to get a better prediction of how that um, hurricane was going to uh, pass. And what you can see is that uh, that temporal data that we got previously was allow allowed us to make predictions that it was actually going to hit Miami and Tampa, then on up to Jacksonville. And so even um, if you have biased data, the more temporal data you get, the better the predictions are. And that's a key element that we want to bring to cancer. We want to get more temporal information. And one of the key treatments that we're trying to uh, facilitate is called adaptive therapy. And it's a very different approach to treating cancer because currently we use what's called the maximum tolerated dose. So if we look at this um, cartoon here and we look at the tumor and we imagine that all of those colors represent the heterogeneity that the tumor has. Traditionally what we do is we give the maximum tolerated dose, that's what the MTD is, and it will eradicate all of the sensitive cells in the tumor. And what it leaves behind is only those resistant cells, the pink cells. If we continue to treat that tumor, we're actually giving the patient extra drug that can't do them any good. In fact, it's only doing them harm. Because what happens is those resistant cells continue to grow under that maximum tolerated dose treatment and eventually will cause relapse and, and failure. So instead, Bob Gantam has come up with this new adaptive strategy where instead of giving the maximum tolerated dose, he gives the maximum effective dose. And the effective dose in this case is to try and reduce the tumor size, but not eradicate all of those sensitive cells. And so you can see we leave behind some of those green cells as well as the pink. And now we stop the treatment. And this is a critical point. By stopping the treatment, what we do is we allow those sensitive cells to grow back. And they actually grow back faster than their resistant counterparts. And that allows us now to, to loop this whole behavior and restart, give the maximum effective dose, have a treatment holiday, and control that disease for far longer than we would with the maximum tolerated dose. Now, for this to work, what's required is that those sensitive cells have to be fitter than their resistant counterparts. So resistance has to have a cost. And resistance will have a cost because they're trying to push out the drug. They're trying to use energy to evade the toxic effects of that drug. And this graph here shows clearly when we compare breast cancer MCF7 cell line that's sensitive to treatment with its counter um, doxorubicin resistant um, population. So the red are the resistant, the green are the sensitive, and we've plated them together in a dish. And just after 10 days growing under serum conditions, what happens is that those sensitive cells outcompete their resistant counterpart. And it clearly shows then resistance has a cost. So to illustrate this clearly, we developed a mathematical model. And um, what you're going to see here is on the left, there's a, a maximum tolerated dose tumor you're going to see. And on the right, you're going to have an adaptive therapy strategy. These two tumors are identical. The color of the cells represents how resistant they are. And if you look very closely, what you can see, there's only a few resistant cells right in the heart of that tumor. The bulk of the tumor is sensitive. So when I treat this tumor, what you can see on the left is that that maximum tolerated dose very quickly selects for the resistant cells. Whereas on the right hand side, our adaptive strategy when we switch the treatment on and off really facilitates controlling that tumor for far longer. And that principle is exactly what we're playing out in patients. Now in patients, 
you don't tend to get a single metastasis, just like I showed you with the melanoma patient, they often have multiple lesions. So we can create a simulation where in this case, it's six metastases that we're gonna treat systemically. So we give the drug to the entire system and it's gonna control, or in this case, because it's maximum tolerated dose, it's gonna cause them to, to fail treatment. So when we give that maximum tolerated dose, you see some of them respond but the bulk of them don't, and so they just grow back. We can take the exact same six tumors and we can give them this adaptive treatment instead. And when we do that, what you'll see is that rather than them growing back and failing, they are go through this kind of birth and death process where they're kept under control for far longer. And so again, it's the exact same six tumors, but now we're switching that treatment on and off depending on how the entire burden is growing over time. And so that gives us control for far longer compared to resistance in a short period of time. And right now we're doing this very treatment uh, strategy in patients in metastatic prostate cancer. So prostate cancer affects many men one in six of us will be diagnosed with it, and one in 35 are going to die from it. Um, here you can see a patient who has metastatic prostate cancer, and this scan shows their bone, because often prostate cancer metastasizes to the bone, and those sort of pale dappled lesions are actually where the tumor is calcifying the bone. And so really what we're trying to do here is give these patients this abiraterone treatment, which is the treatment for when they failed the first line metastatic treatment in an adaptive way. Rather than maximum tolerated dose, we're giving them this effective dose and controlling that cancer for longer. So uh, basically based on our mathematical models, we're able to predict that by using the PSA as a metric of tumor burden. So PSA, this plot shows samples taken from a patient's blood over time and we can measure the PSA. And basically that shows how much tumor they have in their system. And by reducing um, the PSA under the drug, when it falls to 50% of its baseline value, we stop the treatment. When it comes back to its baseline value, we start the treatment again. And that very simple strategy emerged from a mathematical model which uses game theory. What you can see here is over the period of a year, there's three individual treatments that patient got rather than the standard of care, which would be continuous treatment, okay? And this patient's still under control under this treatment. Let me show you another patient. In this case, it's almost a year and a half. And what you can see is for almost the first half year or so, they're under continuous treatment till their PSA falls, then we stop the treatment. And there's an extended period there where there's no treatment, then it comes back up, we start the treatment again. And so you can see now what this drives is a truly individualized treatment strategy for every patient. Basically, based on their responses, you're gonna get very different treatment dynamics. This is a patient who's currently under this treatment, and he'll explain to you what he thinks of how this treatment works. So clearly, if you only show these cancer cells once in a while, the, uh, the Zytiga, instead of continuously, it seems to the layman that that seems a pretty good idea to um, at least delay the cancer cells from um, um, seeing that this Zytiga is a pretty deadly thing and how to combat it. So I was, I was very pleased to go on it. There was, never, there was never any doubt that I would do so. So he said in a very succinct way, um, essentially showing that tumor um, too much drug allows it to become resistant to the disease. And that makes a lot of sense um, in a kind of intuitive way because really what we're doing is selecting for those resistant cells. Here's the results from the, uh, for that first trial for 12 patients. Each line here represents a patient's life on and off treatment. So red means they're on, black means they're off treatment. And when you contrast each one of those patients, what you can see is that no two patients have the same treatment strategy. 
you also can see that they're all sort of slightly different lengths. And part of the reason for that is because when they are accrued onto the trial, it's at different points in time. They don't all start the trial at the same time. So this trial's ongoing. It's still been, uh, it's now some like three and a half years it's been running. And you can see that only one patient in this cohort has failed. If we contrast that with the standard of care where we're given the maximum tolerated dose, what you can see is almost all of those patients have actually failed that treatment. So very different to our adaptive strategy. And in fact, right now we're sitting at something like three times um, the time to progression. So almost three times the survival uh, compared to this maximum tolerated dose. And we're using less than half of the drug. So that's a pretty, pretty fantastic result, I think. So that one trial has inspired many others. And we're in the process of accruing in a first-line prostate trial, in a new melanoma trial, where we're given targeted tr uh, treatments in sequence and trying to smartly deliver that maximum effective dose. We're writing a protocol in ovarian. The thyroid trial just got accepted and we have one in breast and GBM in the works. So that really shows, in some sense, the power uh, of integrating mathematical models with evolutionary principles. And who to say it better than Charles Darwin himself, who really emphasizes the importance of collaboration in driving survival. And truly, this is a collaborative, multidisciplinary uh, exercise. This, the, our center of excellence brings together many diverse scientists and without each one of those um, parts of that expertise we couldn't actually achieve what we've managed to achieve today. So thank you and thanks for all of your input and thanks for making this a success.